Thank you very much for everything that he does um, in Australia, leading that particip participation um, from the grassroots right through to elite. And I do think it's incredibly important that we commend uh, him also for the system work that he's doing to change the structures that are, uh, have been inhibiting women to actually take those leadership roles. I would also like to um, do a shout out today to Moya Dodd, to um, Emma Haywood, Highwood, sorry, Emma, um, to Kimon, who's at the back there somewhere, and also Sue Crow, who's one of the Vic Health board members. And importantly, um, all the athletes, leaders, administrators from FFA and FFE that are here today, and all of you people here that make this um, sport and this code just such a fantastic and exciting um, place to be. We are incredibly excited um, to be here speaking today and I really do thank FFE and FFA for the opportunity to be sharing with you what we've been doing at Vic Health. Um, so I'm going to be sharing some of our work, not just in female participation, but also importantly in gender equality and our insights about driving women's participation for sport and for importantly health and wellbeing. Now, for those of you that don't know us, Vic Health was established in 1987 by the Victorian government as the world's first health promotion foundation. And while our um, original foundations were about buying out tobacco sponsorship in sports and the arts, things like, you may not remember the Benson and Hedges Australian Ballet, that actually was a real thing 30 years ago. Um, today, our work is guided by a 10-year vision and we have five key areas that we work in that you can see up on the screen there, which I won't read out. But everything we do is driving towards a single ambition, which is one million more Victorians with better health and wellbeing by 2023. And I think importantly for the period of the action agenda that we're in now from 2016 to 2019, we've actually identified gender as a critical focus for us in our strategic imperatives. So, Vic Health's vision um, is for a Victoria where everyone can realise their full potential for health and wellbeing, and that's regardless of gender. And I know I'm talking to a kind of a converted room today, but I do just want to put some kind of theory and practice around it as well before I go on to the examples about specifically how we've been driving the change across um, the sector. But we really are committed to a Victoria where girls can grow up without those gendered social norms that limit their schooling, their careers and their everyday life. And a Victoria where women and girls can see themselves in leadership positions in our major institutions and the male dominated sports sectors um, is certainly one of those sectors that we know we need, need to be able to be making those changes and influencing. Now, there are a range of organisations that we partner with, including women's health, sport, media, education, arts, workplaces, local government, and they've made great strides in tackling gender inequality over many years. And I think for us also importantly, we've spent over a decade investing in the prevention of violence against women, and which those of you that understand that, understand that gender equality is actually at the heart of what drives, the, uh, what drives violence against women. So that's why gender equality is just so critical critical for us um, to be addressing here. In Victoria, we've had the Royal Commission into Family Violence. We've had 227 recommendations, which the um, Victorian government have agreed to implement in full. We've got a gender equality strategy. We've got a prevention strategy. Um, and we've also got a whole lot of other kind of supported strategies and systems that allow us to drive the type of change that we need to be doing. Um, I think it won't be a surprise to anybody in the room that we have identified sport as a really key setting for action in our strategy. And the, um, it's in line with our three-year priority for physical activity, which is to get 180,000 more Victorians being physically active, playing sport and walking by 2019. And that has a focus on women and girls. And I'm not talking about the women and girls who, you know, maybe are out and about once or twice a week. We're talking about the women and girls that have absolutely no interest in physical activity whatsoever. And I'll talk a little bit about how we're driving that in a second. Um, we know, as the Minister mentioned, that physical activity can reduce the incidence of disease and disability. It prevents risk factors like obesity, improves mental wellbeing, but more than two thirds of women are currently classified as inactive or somewhat active. Um, and some people are more likely to be in these categories, and I think that's important as well to understand that women and girls from Indigenous and culturally and linguistically diverse communities are more likely to be in that category. Um, those with lower levels of education and lower incomes, 
and women and girls living in socio-economically disadvantaged neighbourhoods. And if we look at sport more, spe more specifically, we know that women's participation rate are half those of men. Um, there are life stages at which girls are more likely to stop playing sport, with the drop-off age at 15 being particularly significant. And that's the kind of cliff that we talk about at VicHealth in terms of participation. And as women get older, even if they do manage to stay being physically active, their participation rate, their rates just continue to decline. Um, and there's clear evidence also, as you all know, that women are still up, up, um, underrepresented in sports media coverage, as well as um, leadership as well. And not to mention the lack of adequate news um, and media coverage and pay disparity between female athletes and their male counterparts. And in 2015, we commissioned research to find out more about what impacts Victorians at those different life stages and how, um, how and what influences them in their decisions around physical activity. And the research identified five key life stages where women and girls are ready to be motivated and to be more active. They are young people aged 12 to 17, young adults aged 18 to 24, adults aged 25 and over with no children, parents um, and, ret and retirees as well. And when we look at um, why these groups of women and girls who weren't active, there were some clear messages and barriers about sports participation. Now this is important to really think about from the context of your own um, code and your own clubs and your own organisations. So women know the health benefits. So saying, oh, being physically active is really good for you is not enough to get those women into the room and out on a park or even out their front door in the first instance. It's just not enough to motivate them to be active. There are some practical barriers, which the minister talked about, those kind of pieces around um, changing rooms, but also there's things about having enough time, money and access to sport opportunities. And I'll talk a little bit about some insights around that in a second. There is a shift away from organised sport into less organised ways of being physically active. So we are ch seeing a whole movement away into more flexible social options. And this code has the absolute kind of, I think, for me, some of the best ways that it can actually capture that. And again, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and importantly, our research identified the universal barrier across life stages. So this is the silver bullet, okay? So if you take one thing away from what I'm gonna say today, it's this bit, that women feel intimidated, embarrassed, and, ex and um, they feel intimidated in and embarrassed to exercise in public because they have a fear of judgment. It's a deep, really deep-seated place for women that they fear that they're going to be judged if they walk out that front door and are physically active. And I can tell you some, I would call horror stories about people, members of parliament, one of my staff members just the other day, who actually went for a walk at lunchtime, you know, had on a pair of shorts and a t-shirt just off having a walk and just got, you know, a car pulled up next to her and said, you know, you shouldn't be out, you shouldn't be doing this you look fat, get back into the office. I mean, that kind of stuff absolutely happens. So no wonder why women have this fear of even just putting on something to be physically active. So that's what that's the deep fear that we are trying to address via the work at VicHealth. Um, oh, sorry. And this fear um, of judgment is summarised in these findings here. And I won't read them all out, but you can see many of them are about their appearance. So it's about being red in the face. Um, sweaty or jiggling when they exercise. Um, they're also afraid about others judging their ability to actually play sport and how competitive or knowledgeable they are. Um, some women are also concerned about others judging them for prioritising exercise because you should be spending time with your family and friends and with your kids and you shouldn't be, that, you know, you shouldn't be stepping out and looking after yourself. You shouldn't be um, prioritising exercise if you're studying or working. So when taken, these findings um, really do help us understand and inform our new female sports initiatives. And I'm going to highlight three of them today. So our Active Women and Girls for Health and Wellbeing program has three streams of activity. There's participation, profile and leadership. And it sits across four activity areas. Um, so we've got a Vic Health Gender Equality in Sport Leadership Pledge, which formalises our sports partners commitment. And it was signed by all of our sports partners across each of these initiatives. And our new campaign, This Girl Can, is aligned to the activity areas that focus on participation, stereotypes and attitudes and profile. 
So the first initiative I'll talk about is our Active Women and Girls for Health and Wellbeing. It aims to increase the number of women and girls who are physically active while also at the same time raising the profile of women's sport in the media and championing the important role women play in sports leadership and management. We're working with a number of state sporting associations, elite teams, national sporting organisations, including FFE, uh, Melbourne City FC and Melbourne Victory FC. And what we're working with um, those clubs and codes is to address the barriers that women face when they're trying to get active. And the program has three areas which I'll go through now. So the first one is about participation. And this stream targets the less active women and girls in those four key life stages that I talked about. So we're asking our partners to identify one of those groups, not all of them, because it's really hard just even to get a few women being active. So we're asking them to target one um, of the groups and then tailor their participation opportunities to them. Um, and as many of you know, our friends at FFV are part of this initiative. And the Soccer Mums program, um, and you can see the banner as you walked in today, um, is one of these programs that aims to increase physical activity amongst mothers from a range of cultural backgrounds through small-sided social football. So again, that's addressing the move away from organised sport into more social, flexible ways of thinking about participating. Um, FFE is partnering with Melbourne City to offer mums a simple way to enjoy enhanced health and wellbeing in a family-friendly and fun environment. And the mother's football teams will be established in football clubs and community groups across Victoria. The profile element of the program aims to increase the visibility of women in sport and improve attitudes towards women's sport. And earlier this year, we brought together a coalition of elite sports teams to help raise the profile of women's sport under the banner Change Our Game. And it was a fantastic opportunity for Vic Health to ensure our sports partners could use their voice, because they have a very strong voice across the community, to capitalise on that growing momentum again that the Minister talked about. And I think what's exciting to see um, in this photo that was taken in January um, has been the continued development of women's sport over this year, culminating last night in just such a a fantastic game by the Matildas. Um, so we've seen the face of women's sport change dramatically across um, our community, um, across our media and across all of our elite areas as well. Um, we've had the Victorian government deliver the Active Victoria strategy. We've also seen, and I know you heard from Bridie yesterday, um, who's the new CEO for the um, Office for Women's Sport and Recreation. So some big structural changes that are happening here in Victoria. Um, the next step of the Active Women and Girls program for us will involve our sport partners promoting our new initiative, This Girl Can, which I'll come back to in a moment. But the third and final element of this particular piece is our leadership um, arm, and it focuses on building organisational leadership to create those um, welcoming, inclusive environments for women and girls. And we know that there's significant commitment for this across the sector already. Um, in October, we brought together the leaders of each funded sport, including FFE, Melbourne City and Melbourne Victory, to sign a Gender Equality in Sport Leadership Pledge. And it's a little bit different to the Male Champions of Change Pledge um, in sports. This is not just an individual signing that particular pledge, but it's the whole um, organisation. And there's been some instances over the last couple of months where we've actually been able to pick up the phone and say to the organisation, look, there are some things happening in the public and in media and we need you to be addressing that, which is, um, we've been able to help work on those messages. But what um, each sport is committed to is celebrating sports women and sports men equally, to achieve a gender balance in their marketing and public events and to prioritise access for women and girls in the facilities that they use. And this is just a little example. I mean, it seems like a simple thing to say, achieving gender balance in their marketing and public events. But I don't know about you, but I go to a lot of um, annual dinners, sports dinners, awards nights, et cetera, et cetera. And next time you go to one of those events, just as you walk in, just have a think about who's greeting you. Is it, you know, a group of women in, you know, black dresses with little iPads? Are, are they the people that you're that are greeting you and why have they got that particular role? Why isn't it a group of men in suits? Up on the stage when the awards are being given out, again, is it women? dressed in a particular way to give out those awards and not actually a gender balance of men and women up on, those, up on the stage. It's those types of signals. They're the signals that we're actually working with 
all of our partners to change. And let me tell you, it makes a massive difference to an event. It really does bring in um, the women in the room feel totally different about the event when you actually think about how what, up, what is up on stage and what is being represented and how those women are experiencing that event in the same way that you want women to experience a great, op, um, a great experience when they go to your particular organisation or your code or your football club. Think about that for your public events as well because it's actually quite challenging to do that. Um, and I go on to This Girl Can, which we are pretty excited about here in Victoria. Um, as many of you may know, it was first developed by Sport England in 2015 as a campaign to get more women to be physically active. If you haven't seen it, I really do suggest you get on and watch the video. I won't play it for you now. Um, but it is an incredible campaign that helped women to get moving regardless of their size, their shape um, and their ability. Um, there are a couple of examples of the ads up here. They were developed on the stories from the women. And I think that's, one again, one of the other powerful things of this campaign. They're not, you know, I kick stereotypes. I, sorry, I kick right in the stereotypes. That's not an advertising line. That's actually one of the lines from the women. And I think that's what's incredibly powerful about this campaign is that it's incredibly authentic. Um, Sports England had phenomenal results, there's no two way about it. And this is what we would call a public health campaign. It had 2.8 million women in across um, the UK being more physically active. And again, not the women that are out and about once or twice, but the really hard to reach women that have never ever, after they've you know dropped off that cliff, age 15 in, in um, high school, thought about going back out and being physically active. So we are now partnering with Sports England, uh, the very first organisation internationally to deliver this campaign here in Victoria and in Australia. This Girl Can um, Victoria, the way that we're focusing on, it's a little bit different to Sports England, and this is part of our partnership with Sports England. Yes, it is a physical activity campaign, but it's incredibly important also that it is viewed from the lens of how I talked about at the beginning as a gender equality lens as well. So what we want to be able to do is shift attitudes so that women um, are more positive towards being active and playing sport. We want to drive act, um, act, action so more women can plan to be active and actually are active. And again, this is the important thing for us. We want to shift those social norms so the whole community has positive attitudes towards women being active. And as I gave you that example before about someone walking out their front door and being told they were too fat to get back inside, we want to shift that stereotype and want to change, change that stereotype so women can actually own public spaces in quite a different way. So as you can see, for us, this is much more than just a campaign um, about sport. It's a campaign that's fundamentally going to change the way that all Victorians see women and girls being active, how they're, de how they're depicted, and I think also how we view ourselves as women. The campaign is going to be based on experiences and stories of everyday Victorian women who are all kinds of active, and we're currently collecting those stories um, across Victoria. These are a couple of examples of some of the stories we've had so far from Victorian women. Jamie on the right told us how she felt intimidated to get back into sport after she'd had a baby, and particularly because of the images on social media and what she calls um, the fitness mums. But we know from a public health perspective the whole new movement of fitspiration that's happening, which is becoming incredibly damaging for women's body images and um, self-worth, and there's a whole body of evidence that's actually coming out around that. Um, they post their pictures of their six packs and it's again just this unattainable image of what women should be like when they're being physically active. So for her the realisation was that um, people love her because of who she is, not what she looks like. And I think if you think about the women and girls in your life, that is who you love and why you love them, not because of how they may look in a bikini or in a whatever it is that they might be wearing. So that for her mentally helped her get back um, into playing soccer without worrying about um, that fear of judgment of her body. Um, and I saw her last week as we're developing up the campaign that we'll be releasing next year. Um, I'm sure she won't mind me saying. She's pregnant with a second child. And to see her out and about playing um, football last week, it was a pretty hot day actually. She was 
awesome. She was just fantastic having, yeah, she's quite an incredible woman. So they're the kind of stories that we want to be gathering. Um, we've been having this mobile story pod that has been going around the state, visiting a whole lot of events in metropolitan and also regional Victoria. And again, you go in and we've been capturing these fantastic stories from women. Um, and that will, again, forms part of the narrative our, of our program. In February, we're going to launch the statewide campaign. So again, it will be the first time this ad has been recreated outside of the UK. No pressure, no pressure for us <laughs> at all. Um, but it involves advertising, PR, um, social media, um, media engagement as well. And the campaign uh, website is also going to showcase the stories we've collected via that um, pod and give information on how they can get involved in sport. Importantly also, we're sharing all of these resources with our sports partners and all of those organisations that we're partnering with. There's toolkits, there's a whole range of resources that they will be getting. So what we're working on, I guess, is um, making sure that the supply side is right. So football, whatever code it is, is ready when the demand side happens. So when women do feel positive enough to potentially walk through your door, you don't turn them away simply by that person at reception looking them up and down when they walk in and, and for, for that woman they feel like they're being judged and they turn around and walk out the door. So really simple things that we're going to be working on with our partners. Um, I think just going back to this slide that I showed before, I'm hoping that I've been able to demonstrate how This Girl Can Victoria is going to increase the demand for physical activity opportunities for women and girls. And while our sports partnerships are really important to amplify the campaign reach, and as I said, we want to increase that supply um, and demand side as well. So these are just some of the major initiatives that we're working on at Vic Health to drive gender equality in sport. I hope you can see it's quite a holistic program. Um, and if you want to learn more about our work in driving this particular area, please go to our website. There are a heap of resources up there and you can also register for your interest in This Girl Can by using the link on the website there. So thanks very much for your time this morning. Thank you so much, Gerald. Uh, we do have some time for questions, if uh, anyone has something that they would like to ask. Don't be shy. We've got microphones uh, available to come around. Perhaps, Gerald, can you tell us... Um, uh, Emma's... Uh, <laughs> Emma's ready to go. Emma's always got a question. That's all right. Good on you, Emma. Uh, thank you. That was an amazing presentation. I think Victoria's very lucky to have Vic Health. Thank you. Um, so I, I think that was demonstrated today of some of the progressive thinking in this space. Um, so we've got traditional sports that are very structured and we're very focused on the, the club side. Which are the sports that you see are really some examples that are able to develop some models which are being slightly more progressive in welcoming more people into their sport? Yep. I mean, I do think the example here in Victoria about soccer mums is one of those um, programs and I guess we've been working for quite a while to develop that up in partnership. And I think that's also one of the other things is that it's incredibly hard... I think for um, any code who has a traditional way of thinking about their business and their, um, you know, you get members, you have elite teams, you have a board, you know, you have events, to really be thinking about how you can be innovative in delivering your program offering. So I guess that's what the team and Shelley here from Vic Health, she'll, you know, if you want to see, if you want to talk about innovation, Shell's the person to talk to. Um, but I think some of the other codes, um, Netball actually have done a fantastic job at doing a program called Rock Up Netball. And it's a really simple premise. Um, and, you know, they've got fast fives that they've been modifying the game but rock up netball is a really simple really simple premise where on any particular night you could just rock up to a netball court and it doesn't matter what your skill type is doesn't matter actually whether or not you've registered or not registered you can play and it has gone gangbusters it's actually becoming something really significant for netball and will probably be um, the evidence is showing us it's something that might go across um, Australia as well um, we've had some I'm trying to rack my brain through some of the other codes. Um, we've had, I mean, tennis has been really good at it without a doubt. You know, they, again, they've modified, modified their game, but also just being able to have opportunities where tennis is the skill by which you are physically active as opposed to playing tennis. So using all those, um, you know, using the 
the skills of tennis as, you know, catching a ball, um, running, walking around a court. So using that as a way that you can get women attracted to actually just being physically active. And I think the research is really showing us that if you think about an iceberg, it was I probably need a new slide. I think we're beginning to... We're, we're, and I think maybe what you're hearing also is that the research is very new on all of this too. But if you think about an iceberg, you know, that little bit at the top there, those women that you attract um, to be physically active, they're a very small proportion of people who actually might go into your game and join a club, join a team, you know, train Tuesday, Thursday night, play on a Saturday. It's the one sitting under the water, that massive group under the water. They're the ones that you want to be attracting and they're the ones that you want to be developing up those more social offerings. So some of the things we know, it needs to be fun, it needs to be flexible, um, it needs to not be not be competitive. They're not necessarily interested in competitive, but also they don't want it to be too soft. It's pretty hard, I know. Market segmentation is pretty hard. But they don't want it to be too soft. They don't want to just feel like they're just walking around the park and actually not doing anything. So um, our website's got lots of resources up there, Emma. I'll give you a couple of examples. Not very good ones, though. Oh, stand-up paddleboarding. Sorry, my board member just went like this to me. <laughs> Forgot that. My first summer, too, it's my favourite sport. Stand-up paddleboarding has been absolutely massive um, as a sport. A big, big... Um, increase in women doing stand-up paddleboarding. And I guess by the very nature of that, it is just more flexible as well. Uh, Gerald, uh, Vic Health is doing so much uh, in terms of wellbeing and health and, and that side of participation. Can you talk to us about whether they're doing anything with clubs uh, to change culture and make them more female-friendly? Yeah, look, um, I think that's a big part of the work that we're doing with all of the sports that signed up to our leadership pledge. So we've got 19 sporting organisations that have signed up to that. Um, and incredibly important that the culture in those organisations is supportive of women and girls. And we, ha we have a community of practice. So what that means is that anyone that we're partnering with, we bring them into Vic Health. I think, you know, sometimes people might go, oh, do I have to go to Vic Health today? Do I have to go to that session? But actually, they're really fantastic opportunities where sports are learning from each other about how they can create that culture change within their organisation. Um, and some of the learnings, I mean, again, we're very early stages in that. Some of the things we've been able to do, as I mentioned before, is there's been, you know, some clubs in the media, we've been able to pick up the phone and say, you know, your response to that isn't good enough, we want you to do X, Y and Z. Um, we've also been able to work with some clubs, um, not some clubs, sorry, some codes where we can actually talk to them about, because one of the other things we're doing is targets on boards. Um, and working with those organisations to help them around what they're going to need to have in place, the systems, the policies, the practice, the culture, uh, for women to be able to join that particular organisation. So, again, there's a whole raft of um, um, resources on our website, Steph. Great, thank you. Moya's the other one who will always, it's always have a question. Emma and Moya. <laughs> I, I don't my mind. First question. It's my first question. Go, on, Moya. She's been after me for two days now. It's coming back, Steph. It's coming back to you. Um, you mentioned the Fitspiration movement mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know the yummy mummies who post pictures of their six packs and so on. Um, what, what do you what do you think we're able to do to counter that? Because in a sense, these are people who've taken on the uh, fitness mantra. They've done it, they've achieved a body that they wanted and then they want to show it to the world. But in fact, they might be reinforcing all of yeah. the attitudes and behaviours that you're trying to address. How will you counter that? Look, I think it's a, it's a really good question. And in the same way as I think that um, this idea of um, being strong is the new feminine, that whole thing about strong is the new way of being in the world. Um, I mean, a part of it is not to follow them on Instagram. You know, part of it is actually, seriously, do not follow these people on Instagram because they are often paid by how many followers they have. So you're actually reinforcing the fact that they um, are marketable and that they're driving the type of conversation that we're having across Australia. So I think that's incredibly important. Just simply 
block them. <laughs> no, unfollow, unfollow them. Um, but I think it's also incredibly important that we are countering those images with the images of real women that we've been showing here today. So that's why, I mean, you know, the Federal Minister talked about Girls Make You Move and that's a campaign aimed at younger women. This girl can is over 18 and in those market segmentations that I talked about. Um, that's why we need, we do need to be spending money to actually be having those messages, those counter messages across all of those platforms where um, young women and girls are seeing those images and being deeply affected by them. And not just young women. I mean, you know, when I'm on Instagram and I see those, I feel pretty miserable after looking at it for half an hour. You just feel like it's totally unattainable. Um, so there is very strong research coming out too, more, and I think that's incredibly important. So it is a, it's a new area that's happening. The research is only just emerging, but we are seeing it from a public health perspective as one that we actually need to address. Um, so yeah, so there's it's a new area, um, but yeah, don't follow them. We need the counter images, and we also need to be really be able to make sure that we're telling the stories of real women. I think. Do we have time for one more? Hi. Um, Hello. Just in terms of the drop-off age of around 15, um, which is the age group that I coach at the moment, Yeah. Um, what sort of strategies are in place to help that sort of age group to stay in the sport? Um, and also, one of the issues I noticed last year was when we're at training, things like the boys' teams making comments to the girls as they're warming up and things like that, mm. and then they don't come to training the following week. Yeah. Are there initiatives in place for educating young boys as well in terms of changing the, the image of women? Um, it's a new area for us. Thank you very much. Sorry, what was your name? Uh, Ari. Ari, yeah. Ari, thank you very much for that um, question. And also those insights, they're the type of insights that I think we have anecdotally all around us. And um, we haven't been able to capture those via research yet because we're just beginning to think about how to actually address the 15. It is, if there is no silver bullet for that 15 age group yet, no one is kind of being able to really address it. But Sport England actually did just release some research, I think it was two weeks ago, where they're actually really focusing on uh, the importance of um, the teachers in schools and how they work with young women. And I don't think, that's not rocket science. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious, but as our curriculum has changed so dramatically um, and sport has become just something that is just so low on the priority, um, having people that are trained to actually be able to work with those girls that are out about the age 15 and actually supporting them and encouraging them as opposed to doing all the other things that they do. So the research from Sport England I think is probably where I'd direct you um, at the moment and I think we've tweeted it out actually and if we haven't we'll make sure that we do again out of today. But for us at VicHealth it is an area that we're going to actually start investigating here, um, putting some doing some kind of seminal research, some market research on it, um, and then we'll also be developing up some programs because it's a really critical piece for us. Joel, thanks so much. Thanks, uh, we Steph. could probably pepper you with questions all morning, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately we've run out of time. Joel Rector, thank you. <laughs>